my name is Evie Clay, I'm an ophthalmology doctor in the UK and in this video I'm going to be talking about how to get into ophthalmology training. You're probably a bit worried about how high the competition ratios are and you can see in this document which I'm going to bring up now. You can see here in the specialty training document that the competition ratio to enter training in ST1 was 5.73 in 2020. But to be honest, a lot of the competition ratios on this page are pretty high as well. So clinical radiology was 4.21. And there are others that are way higher, like cardiothoracic surgery at 9.92, which is insane, and TNO in Scotland at 24.56. That is a crazy number. My point is, don't let a seemingly high competition ratio stop you from applying, because someone needs to get in and it could be you. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about a brief overview of the application process, how I got into ophthalmology training myself, and then a bit about the MSRA and then preparing for the portfolio and the interview itself. So just to give a brief overview of the application process, what normally happens is that you sign up onto Oriel in November and you'll get an email in December asking you to sign up to the MSRA, which stands for the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, and you have to go to an exam centre, a test centre to do this test. If you do well enough in it, you'll hear back in a couple of weeks telling you your results and whether you've got an interview. And you only get an interview if you do if you do well enough in the MSRA. The best place to start when you're preparing for your ophthalmology application is the Seven Deanery website. I'll link it in the description below. It's best to check out the most up-to-date timetable there. And then you'll find also resources on how to prepare your portfolio, how to prepare for the interview and the MSRA as well. All right, so this is the story of how I got into ophthalmology training. Um, to be honest, I didn't even know I wanted to do ophthalmology throughout my F1 and F2. Um, I'd even done my MRCP part one as an F1, so as a house officer, and I was all prepared to apply for core medical training. Um, but to be honest, as I was progressing through F1 and F2, I didn't really enjoy the medical on calls very much, all the nights and the weekends. Um, it was pretty stressful, and I, I just didn't really want to do that for the next three years after F1 and F2. Um, and so when my mom suggested that I should apply for ophthalmology, I thought, why not? I had nothing to lose. I gave it a go without thinking I would get in. And I didn't. So yeah, I didn't get into ophthalmology the first time, which was not really very surprising at all because I didn't have much on my portfolio that was even remotely related to ophthalmology. Um, the only thing I managed to do in the weeks leading up to my interview was squeeze in a poster which I presented at a conference on Graves Ophthalmopathy. Um, generally, if you're interested in ophthalmology, you would have done a taster week, um, gone to clinics, gone to theatres and got a letter to show and prove that you did this, which is really good for your portfolio. Um, but I had none of that, so I really just took this as a taster run to see what the interview process was actually like and then hopefully have a chance the following year. In my first attempt of getting into ophthalmology training, I went for the MSRA in January, didn't actually do too badly, managed to get an interview, um, which also didn't go too badly, to be honest, much better than I thought I was going to do. Um, I'm just going to bring a screenshot up now of my interview feedback. So you can see here, my portfolio was suboptimal. I got 40 out of 100, but like I said, I hadn't really done anything remotely in the direction of ophthalmology at this point. Um, so I guess it could really have been worse. For the interview itself, I scored 52.7 for the quip section, so the quality improvement project, and then 70 out of 90 for the clinical and communication station. My total score was 193 out of 300 and ended up ranking about 107th out of the 300 or so people who managed to get an interview. Um, I received this email on offers day, um, which you can see, and I was actually surprised I had even made it into the potentially appointable range of candidates. You'd think I'd be disappointed that I didn't actually get a spot, but I was actually pretty happy. There was clearly room for improvement in the interview itself, but the portfolio was the main thing that let me down. Um, but don't worry if your portfolio is also not your strongest point, because I know loads of people who've gotten into ophthalmology and their portfolio wasn't there main and strong point, but they did so well in the interview that the portfolio just didn't really matter. In that same year, I'd also applied for IMT or core medical training and ended up getting jobs in London. But by that point, even though I got rejected from ophthalmology, I decided I didn't really want to do IMT or CMT and didn't want to spend a whole year doing something that I didn't really enjoy doing um, whilst waiting to get into ophthalmology again. And so what I did instead was I took the year off, went traveling with my husband, and we documented our travels on our Instagram account at Travelo. Um, drop by and say hi. I ended up visiting countries I would never otherwise have visited. I went swimming in turtles. I went camping in the mountains in Italy, sat in the desert in Jordan looking at the stars. Um, it was such a great experience. And if you're thinking about whether you should take a year off, off medicine maybe, um, to go traveling and you're not really too sure, you should definitely, definitely do it if you get the chance. It was a great experience and I wouldn't be the same without it. I did also spend a year trying to improve my portfolio and getting more points on it than I did the year before. Um, so I started with the relatively easier things like doing a taster week, 
um, going for theatres and clinic sessions. One thing to say about that though is to make sure that you get a letter from your consultant to say that you definitely did attend these clinics so you can put that in your portfolio. You need this as evidence because they're not just going to take your word for it. I also reached out to current ophthalmology trainees and I asked them if they had any case reports that wanted writing up and I did manage to write one up and I presented it at a, as a poster at a conference. Um, and that's also really good for adding points to your portfolio. Another good thing to do to show your interest in ophthalmology and also get more points in your portfolio is to attend ophthalmology talks. Um, generally the ones that are CPD accredited are better and they will add points to your overall score. I also signed up to ophthalmology talks because these are a great way of showing your interest in ophthalmology in your portfolio. And I decided to take the plunge and do the FRC of part one. Um, I definitely regretted it when I was traveling through Italy and having to study in the car along the way but I was definitely glad I'd done it once it was over. I think maybe about half of people try to do the FRC of part one before they apply for ophthalmology and it's a great thing to do because it gives you three points on the portfolio scoring system, but don't worry if you haven't managed to have the time to do it because it's absolutely not necessary. I'm just gonna pull up now a screenshot of a summary of my results from my interview from my second application into ophthalmology. So you can see here by the next round of applications a year later, I got my portfolio score up to 74 from 40 and increased my overall score to 238.4 um, and ended up getting my first choice job. I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't need years of proof of dedication to ophthalmology in order to get in. Sometimes you just need to dedicate your time, even if it's just a short amount of time to specific things that are gonna give you more points on your portfolio um, and work on your interview skills as well. And if you don't get in the first time, that's completely okay. Lots of people do not get in the first time. Um, it just gives you an extra year to work on your portfolio, improve things and spend time doing the things you love and with the people you love. Right then, let's jump into the MSRA, which stands for the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, um, which essentially is a multiple choice question exam um, that various specialties use as a shortlisting process for the interviews. It consists of two components. So the first one is an SJT component where they will ask you to rank about five options in terms of appropriateness and how you would respond in a clinical situation. For example, if your consultant comes into work drunk. Um, the second part then is the general medical question bit. So basically what you've learned throughout medical school. After you've signed up on Oriel and you've been deemed an eligible applicant, you'll then be given a link to the MSRA, which I mentioned earlier on in the video. Um, so sign up to this link and then you'll be called for the exam at a test center. Um, and it's actually really important that you go for this exam and you do prepare for it because you'll get an interview depending on how well you do in the exam. There is a cutoff point. I'm not sure what the cutoff mark is, um, but I'll show you a screenshot now of what I scored. So you can see here that when I applied the first time, I scored 31.9 out of 40. And here's a screenshot of my results when I applied the next year, um, where I got 33.4 out of 40. Like I said earlier, I'm not really too sure what the cutoff mark is to get an interview, but there is one and I think it was in the 20s. In terms of preparing for the MSRA, definitely start early. The first part of the MSRA is the general medical questions and the best thing to do for that is to just start practicing as early as possible. I've always used past medicine throughout medical school and for my MRCP part one as well. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't have questions for the FRC part one. iDocs is a good resource for that. Um, but going back to past medicine, I'll just pull it up on the screen right now. So you can see here the past medicine subscription for MSRA for the MSRA question bank is £20 for four months and then £25 for six months. I think I went for the £25 for six months option. I don't actually have any links to past medicine. I just think it's a really good resource, so go check them out. The second part of the MSRA paper is the SJT style questions. I am personally not a fan at all of the SJT style questions. I don't like them, but the best resource for them really is the UK FBO official website. Um, official paper for that so have a look at that and they give you answers as well um, and it's a good thing to go through that kind of early on in your revision and then kind of closer up as well. Uh, Past Medicine do have a resource for that but I'm not sure how reliable they are really for that section of the paper. Jumping now then into the portfolio section of your ophthalmology application Obviously having a really strong and good portfolio plays a huge role in getting a place in ophthalmology, but even if it's not your strongest point, don't worry because the interview can make up for it. Um, in terms of the weightage, the interview itself definitely makes up more points than the portfolio, at least that was the case when I applied. I tried to do as much as I could for my portfolio because these were sure points that I knew that I would have accumulated prior to the interview. Whereas on the interview day itself, I know that no matter how hard I prepared for the interview, there are still confounding factors like letting stress get the better of me that could affect my score. Um, and so knowing that you've got kind of that little bit of a buffer in your portfolio really makes a huge difference to your stress levels on the day. There are really easy points to pick up in your portfolio, so just make sure you don't miss out on any of them. So for example, in my first year applying to ophthalmology where I didn't get in, 
Um, I guess I didn't spend too much time on, on the portfolio and making it look presentable and I only got one point out of three points for the overall presentation and the quality. So that's such a shame to miss out on. Um, the next year I definitely put way more effort in um, and in the end I, I got a three out of three for that section. Um, and it really does make a huge difference. If you would like me to make a video on my portfolio and show you how I organized it, let me know in the comments below. I mentioned earlier as well that a good habit to develop along the way is to make sure that whatever evidence you have, so for example, of attending theater sessions or clinic sessions, make sure you've got a signed, written piece of paper saying that you have been to the clinics by your consultant. And the best way to make sure that you get this piece of paper is that you draft a letter yourself. So you can write a letter for your consultant and just ask them to sign it um, at the bottom. Otherwise, sometimes you may not get a reply and it's a little bit tricky, but that's the best way to do it. I also mentioned earlier that the best place to start when you're preparing for your ophthalmology application is to look at the Severn Deanery website. So let me just bring it up to show you the portfolio content page. You can see here that the portfolio is split into different sections. So there's education consisting of qualifications like your intercalated degree and a PhD up to a maximum of four points um, and prizes and awards up to a maximum of five points. The number of points you get depends on whether you got the prize in your undergraduate degree or a national or international training. For training and experience, you can get up to a maximum of 12 points. So this is like what I mentioned earlier, uh, what, what you've done to show your commitment to ophthalmology. There's also the training and experience section of your portfolio where you can score up to a maximum of 12 points. Um, you get one point for each piece of evidence indicating commitment to specialty. Um, so things like having done the FRC of part one, like I mentioned, gets you three points. Uh, having case reports and publications uh, related to ophthalmology can give you up to four points. Doing a previous ophthalmic project and then a taster week as well. Attending meetings can give you up to a maximum of three points, which is a really great thing to do because they are really easy points and just don't miss out on them. There's also the MSF, which gives a maximum of five points. They stipulate that it must have taken place within 18 months of the interview, unless you're not currently within a clinical post. <clears throat> the MSF is pretty straightforward to get when you're coming from foundation training, but if you're not from there, it's all right. There is specific guidance on how to go about getting feedback uh, to present in your portfolio. Audit, research and teaching is also a really big component. Publications can give you a maximum score of 10 points, which is calculated based on the journal impact factor and whether you're a first, second or third author. Uh, try and present an audit that is related to ophthalmology and it must have been done within the last three years of the interview date. Education and teaching will give you a maximum of five points. So if you've designed an educational course, like you can see here, or an e-learning tool, um, these all contribute writing a chapter in a textbook as well, writing a book, um, and obviously almost come with supporting evidence. The last section is the overall portfolio layout and quality. Like I mentioned before, make sure you get all three points here. You really don't need to buy the most expensive portfolio that is available. I know there are really expensive ones out there costing up to 200 pounds. Um, in the end, I went for a 50 pound one from Grandison Portfolio. Um, I'll include a link down in the description below. You just need to choose one that is sleek, is sturdy, and does the job. I think what made a really big difference in my portfolio is that I had a good and clear content page, which is really important because the interviewers really don't have a lot of time to go through your portfolio. And the easier you make it for them um, to have a look at all your evidence and it's listed out nicely, the easier it is for them to give you the points for that. In the year that I applied for ophthalmology, everything was still in person and we had in-person interviews and we had to bring our physical portfolios to the actual interview. Um, but this year, I know because of COVID, um, they're making everyone upload their documents online. So I'm not quite sure how different it will be and whether you'll need a content page, but it's just something to keep in mind and have a look at the updates on the website. The last section of this video then is a little bit about the interview process itself. So when I went for the interview, um, when I was applying for ophthalmology, there were two main sections. The first one was a communication and clinical knowledge station. Um, and the second one was a research and a quality improvement project station. I think what I found most challenging and the most difficult was the research section of the interview. Um, what we had to do was read a research paper. It could have been a case report or an RCT. And then we had to answer quite a few questions about it afterwards. And they would ask things like, were there any sources of bias and other statistical questions as well. But again, because of COVID, everything is completely changed. Instead of an in-person interview, they've switched it to a Microsoft Teams assessment where you'll have to converse with an actor for 10 minutes um, and conduct a consultation. So it sounds like it might be really similar to our clinical communication station we had in the in-person interview where we either had to generally either break bad news um, or explore a new diagnosis with a patient or even have to deal with an angry patient. The principles of preparing for the interview station will stay the same though. It just involves practice and starting early. Find someone you can practice with and if you can do it even online over, over Microsoft Teams, that would be even better. And the more you're able to replicate the scenario it will be on the day, the more easy you'll feel on the day itself and the better you'll do. It can be really scary when you know that you're the first batch of guinea pigs in that sense. 
um, going for a newly formatted interview or an exam, but the principles really do just remain the same. And these principles are to start practicing early and to start practicing with someone in the same conditions that you would come across on the day itself. And the better you are able to replicate um, what it will be like on the interview day itself, the more prepared you will be and the better you will do. And that's it from me today, guys. I've covered an overview of the application process, my story of getting into ophthalmology where I had to try twice to get in, um, and then a little bit about the MSRA, the portfolio and the interview itself. If you've got any questions about that, drop me a comment below. Um, if you liked the video, give it a like. It really means a lot. And hit subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. I'll see you next time.